Ladies and gentlemen, this is the pilot episode of the RFA Insider Podcast, the podcast where we tell you what's up at Radio Free Asia and take a look behind the scenes. That was Eugene, and I'm Amy. Today, coming up on RFA Insider, we have two stories in the rundown, one from Hong Kong and one from the Asia Fact Check Lab. And then on how it's made, we will talk to Jamian Anderson from the Korean service, who made an excellent report about a Russian travel blogger who was among the first foreign tour to North Korea in four years. All of that and more coming up on RFA Insider. You're listening to the RFA Insider Podcast, made by two real-life staffers at Radio Free Asia. If you'd like to send us feedback, there are many ways you can do this. You can send us an email at insider at rfa.org. You can also comment on our webpage at rfa.org slash English slash insider. Or you can send us a tweet at RFA Insider or visit us in person. No, don't visit us in person. Right, don't visit us in person. But anyway, we'd really like to hear from you. Insert catchphrase here. Huh? Well, that's what it says on the script. Ah, okay. Well, then we'll take you behind the scenes and tell you what the news really means. Hey, that was pretty good. Okay, so this is the RFA Insider Podcast, and your headphones have fallen off of your head, Amy. Uh, so I think this, since this is the first episode, we should kind of give ourselves, uh, our listeners, introductions to who we are and why we're doing a podcast. So first of all, um, I think that the reason we're doing the podcast in English is because all the other services do have their podcasts and their own audiences. But uh, I guess a lot of people, they don't get to know people in the English service that much or in research, in your case. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about who we are and uh, what brought us to Radio Free Asia and why we want to be on a podcast. So we'll start with you. All right. Um, first, I'd like to informally dub this uh, segment Podcast Free Asia. Podcast Free my Asia. failed suggestion. All right. Um, so that was, we were coming up with names for what we would call this. And, and because the station is called Radio Free Asia, she went with Podcast Free Asia. Yes, I'm still gunning for it. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe. But I think RFA Insider is, well, it's our working title. That's still a working title in itself. So, yes. Right. So, tell us more. You are Amy from Research, and what do you do? Um, I'm on the research team, but my work is more towards the evaluations. The so evaluations. RFA is mandated to conduct uh, regular journalistic evaluations of all the mm -hmm. teams just to make sure everybody's on the right track, journalistically speaking. Um, Writing objectively, you know, citing, which can be a challenge for some of the services. Yeah, a lot of times when uh, in the English service, what we do is we get um, translations from the services and then we have to convert it into a working story in English. And we'll get a lot of stories and they'll be very anti-Chinese biased. Right. Like, it's hard to strike that balance sometimes, especially given, you know, the topics that are chosen. That's very interesting. So how is it that you guys are able to um, evaluate? Did you have people that speak all of the languages in research? Um, no, so that is part of my job. Um, I work with the translators that we have to translate oh. the material into English for the experts. Um, but we also recruit a lot of experts who are from the field or from the native country themselves. I see. Okay, well, I am Eugene from the English team. Um, so basically what we do is we take all these the most interesting stories from all of the services. There are nine broadcast languages, including English, at Radio Free Asia. Quickly, do you know what they are? Oh, um... We, do you want to run down? Okay, so English yes. is one, uh, Mandarin Chinese, Cantonese, mm -hmm. uh, then we have Korean. Next, uh, Southeast Asia, we have Laos, Cambodia. Oh, I think you forgot in East Asia. Oh, well, the Tibetans and the Uyghurs yes. are in East Asia. Correct. So Laos, Cambodia, Burma, and, and Vietnam, yes. Yeah. So and as all. a side note, we mm -hmm. also have three dialects for the Tibetan language. So that adds an that's, extra layer of complication. That's true. We do. Um, so the English service, again, we, we take all the best stories from all the different different languages. And then what we do is we add cultural information and context for people who might not uh, be too familiar with the languages or cultures 
that uh, we are that, that we're writing in. So, for example, if somebody puts in something about a certain person that everybody who speaks that language would know, mm-hmm. but some but the average English speaker would not know, then then somebody from the English service would be like, oh, I know who that is. Let me put a little paragraph of explaining what that is. And so then all of our content comes out. So Very that's cool. that in a nutshell. Anyway, let's get to the rundown. And our first story is about Lunar New Year. Oh, um, I like Lunar New Year, don't we? So, yeah. yes, it's just coming on, but this is a very special year, actually, because it's the Year of the Dragon. and year that's of the Dragon. Yes, and especially auspicious year. Um, so much so that China has a bump in birth rate each year of the dragon because... Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard about that. Uh, so, so everybody wants to be born during the Year of the Dragon. Yes, So yeah. they will specifically try to get pregnant within a time frame so that the kid will be born... During the year of the dragon. Yes, so okay. they'll be destined for greatness. And there's actually research on this that um, parents will invest more time and energy and money into their child born into the year of the dragon because oh, really? they believe they're born for greatness. And then so that will actually show in results, right? Hmm. The kid will actually perform better in school and like be more successful. Mm-hmm. So there is some like a little bit of... It's interesting. But, but I wonder, is there any other year besides the year of the dragon that people are trying to be? Like, oh, I really want a horse kid or I want a monkey. Or I something. think there are years that people try to avoid because oh, really? they're like very stubborn signs. Mm-hmm. So like maybe tiger or sheep that they're less okay. enthusiastic about. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, well, it's different, different from the Western Zodiac that I guess people in the West might be more familiar with, perhaps. Yes. Um. I'm a double whammy. I'm a horse and a Leo, which they're apparently both uh, full of themselves. Oh, I'm a Leo too. (laughs) Sweet. I guess we're both full of ourselves. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But tell us more. Tell us more. So what's what's special about the Year of the Dragon in Hong Kong? So this this year is a little different because the Chinese state media is ditching the word dragon and instead introducing the word long. Which means dragon. dragon in Chinese. Yes, the transliteration. Although it's spelled kind of oddly, they've introduced it as L-O-O-N-G. L-O-O-N-G. But the word is long, so it should only have one O, technically. Well, I guess if you're going by the standard romanization, it would have one O. But why did they choose two? That's that's. I that's suppose confusing. maybe L-O-N-G might not have worked so well as they're oh, introducing because, this to right. the Western audience. Right, so they'd be like, this is the year of the long. Yes, so the their long spin on it is... The long history of the long. Oh, that's okay. the two O's. You know, you know. A lot of times when I hear stories like this, this is specifically for an English-speaking audience that they're doing this. Right? Yes. So this is like English content targeted towards the Western world. Right. But everyone in the Western world who hears that is just going to be like, okay, what's a long? And then right. Like, oh, it's a dragon. So then why don't we just call it the year of the dragon? So I don't think this was clearly thought through. The reasoning is that Chinese long is not the Western idea of a dragon. Oh. Um, so they're pointing out that dragons in Chinese culture are very much associated with positive things like right. the emperor, nobility, um, good fortune, water in some cases, while the Western dragon is more like the fire breathing, you know, like antagonist of the like, fairy like tale. Like smog from uh, Lord of the Rings. Or yes. no, The Hobbit, sorry. Yeah. S- same, same, same author. But anyway. Like the kind that like kidnaps princesses, you know. Right. Um, so some current affairs commentators are kind of seeing this rebrand as like an assertion of, like, cultural confidence for China. Um, They've done this similar thing with Tibet, for example, Mm -hmm. where instead of Tibet, they've replaced it with the The Mandarin, yes, transliteration. Wow. That's, yeah, I remember that story came up recently, and I was like, well, then what do you call the Tibetans in English? Yeah, exactly. Xijiang people? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Or Xijiang men, maybe? (laughs) But then then the men is not English either. Well, what do you think about this? I, I, I think this is... A case of the suits thinking, not clearly cl- thinking this through and, and just saying, well, you know, we want to promote Chinese culture. How can we do that? I know. Why don't we force them to use Chinese words, even though they're speaking English? But I wonder, is this also going to apply to, to other countries in Asia? Because, you know, in Korea, for example, if you're speaking about the year, it's Yongti, right? Mm-hmm. So are they going to have to now not say Yongti anymore and say long i guess that depends if you put your foot down and describe or i guess find a korean dragon the differences if you're physically in korea 
but you're speaking in English, which word do you use? Right. <laughs> I, I think people will continue to use dragon. Yeah. But thank you for introducing that story. Let's go on to the third one. Actually, this comes from the, the Asian Fact Check Lab, which is a division of Radio Free Asia that finds pieces of misinformation, either in the media or on social media, pertaining to or originating from RFA's broadcast areas. Uh, and they try, they they want to um, debunk debunk uh, debunk debunk misinformation. That's mm -hmm. that's a better way to put it. Okay, so today's story uh, is about in 1978. So this is very current, right? Yes. Now, uh, there, on Chinese social media, there was footage of Jimmy Carter in 1978 saying specifically that uh, Taiwan is a part of China. The United States recognizes the government of the People's Republic of China. As a sole legal government of China, there is but one China, and Taiwan is part of China. And they're like, see, America agrees that Taiwan is a part of China. Mm -hmm. But what they actually did is, this is from the speech where uh, Jimmy Carter was saying that we're going to normalize relations with China. In, in order to do that, you have to kind of say, okay, we don't have official relations with Taiwan anymore. We have only official relations with China. But... At the same time, uh, there's two competing ideas. China has the, uh, what is it, the one China principle, whereas the U.S. has the one China policy. The one China principle says there's only one, uh, that the PRC government is the sole legitimate government of China and that Taiwan is a part of China. Mm -hmm. But the one China policy, which the U.S. adheres to, is that we acknowledge that position, however, we don't necessarily agree with it. Yes. And and it's very ambiguous. And so what Carter said is what they made it look like Carter saying by editing this video is there is but one China and Taiwan is a part of China. But actually what happened is they kind of just edited those two things together, leaving out the important part that says... The government of the United States of America acknowledges the Chinese position that there is but one China... And Taiwan is part of China. The government of the United States of America acknowledges the Chinese position that there is but one China and Taiwan is a part of China. So they conveniently left that out. Yeah. Um, so this spread all over uh, Chinese social media. And the AFCL, they usually put out a verdict either saying it's false or misleading. I haven't seen them say true yet. No, not yet. Yeah. Not but uh, in this case, they ruled missing context. So yes, Carter did indeed say those things, but... The key context of the phrase acknowledges the position was left out. Therefore, it is misleading. The strategic ambiguity, I think, yes, is the term. Strategic yes. ambiguity, that's good. Um, <laughs> right. I think, well, this one is really good uh, even for the English audience because I think Taiwan is only really coming into public consciousness for Americans over like maybe the last five to ten years. Yeah, I, I guess that's kind of true. Um, you know, when I was growing up and I had no idea about anything at all, and people said, I'm, I'm Taiwanese, I didn't know that that <laughs> meant that they were Chinese but from a different... I mean, because cause if you say I'm Taiwanese, that could mean you're a native of Taiwan from, like, the indigenous people oh, that were there, Oh, okay, right? that's quite a nuanced take because yeah. I felt like if I said, oh, I'm Taiwanese to somebody, like, yeah. maybe 10 years ago, like, there was maybe a 25% probability that say, oh, Thailand? Oh, you know, <laughs> my yeah. gosh, really? <laughs> Wow, okay. When I was in college, there were, there's like the Chinese Students Association. Ah, okay. And then there's the Taiwanese Students Association. And then the Chinese American Students Association. And then there was the Chinese International Students Association. And they all were always conflicting. Oh, wow. Whenever, and whenever anybody mentioned China, they were like, which China do you mean? <laughs> and they'd argue over each other when they want to have like a... a Chinese cultural festival or Chinese Chinese cultural parties and they'd be like right. oh they'd have their four separate events and you'd have to choose which one you want to go to. Wow. And then then the Chinese American Students Association wanted to incorporate people who had origins either in Taiwan or on the mainland. And then you're talking about many different generations of people that came long before there was even a division in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's very confusing. And uh, during the Lunar New Year this year, uh, my family and we went to, to Chinatown in D.C. And everybody's flying the Taiwanese flag, you know? So, yeah. Or, or, or rather the Republic of China flag. Interesting. So, so, but I wonder if there are people who are not aware of the division and all the history, if they, they would go there and say, why are they not flying the Chinese flag here? That doesn't make any sense. Right. So I don't know. Uh, you might know more about that. So Yeah, uh, for sure. I feel like 
different Chinatowns are composed of different, you oh, know, right, groups yes. like San Francisco, for example, mm-hmm. is mostly like the southern like Guangzhou or like Hong okay. Kongers. Okay. And like Boston, for example, has like the Taiwanese flag right on the gates of oh, Chinatown. Really? really? Yeah. So. Well, I think the gate in the DC Chinatown was a gift from Beijing though, right? Oh, okay. Like in the 80s. But anyway, this has been the rundown. Yes. The rundown. Coming up next is how it's made. How it's made. How it's made. All right, so now we're moving into the segment How It's Made, and we have our guest Jamin Anderson here from the Korean service, who is going to talk about her report about a Russian travel blogger who was among the first to uh, tour North Korea following the opening of borders after COVID. Hi, Jamin. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi, thank it's you for having great me. Great to have you as our first guest. Oh, super Ex- excited. Yes. <laughs> exciting, exciting. So this is the first uh, trip, uh, t- guided tour into North Korea in, in four years. Yes. Uh, so they closed down, I guess, in 2020 at the beginning of the COVID-19 Correct. pandemic. Mm-hmm. And the borders to North Korea have been closed over those four years. So nobody coming in and out from China or Russia. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm curious, like... How how did it, how is it that you f- were able to contact just this random Russian travel blogger? I mean, do you you don't speak Russian, do you? Right. Oh, I wish I could. I got some help from my friend, my good friend, whose name is Google. Oh, <laughs> hey, I have that friend. Yeah. After the tour ended and the tourists returned to Russia on mm-hmm. the 12th, I googled some keywords like Russia, North Korea, tourism mm. in Russian. Oh, with Google Translate. Yeah. Okay. And then I came across Ilya's name from some Russian media outlets. And then I Googled his full name in Russian and ah. found his Instagram, found mm. his Instagram and DM'd him. Yeah, when we were when I was working on the story, uh, when it was assigned to me, I actually um found his YouTube mm-hmm. channel and right. he's got all these travel blogs of like going all these wonderful, fantastic places and I'm, but it's all in Russian and I'm like that's amazing. How did she even find any of this? And there was no North Korea content on there at all at, at the time. Right. Okay. So great. So that's how you found him. Um, so then uh, how long did it take you to, to get into contact with him? Because I guess, did you contact him over Twitter or? Instagram DM. Instagram DM. Yeah. I got a response in almost an hour. Oh, yeah. wow. Wow. Oh, I know. Because considering the time difference, it was afternoon here and the morning there. He was still in Vladivostok on the 13th, on the 14th. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, he was very willing to give comments, actually. That's, oh. that's great. It was very surprising. And as I was compiling my list of my list of the questions, it got quite lengthy. Mm. So I was like, <laughs> hey, <laughs> yo, is it okay if I give you a lot of questions? He said, yeah. Like, is it okay if I give you 10 questions? He said, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this exchange is happening all in Russian? On the DM, it was yeah. all in English. Uh-huh. And then um, I sent him the list of the questions, and then he recorded answers in Russian. And sent oh, with his and voice, right. Yeah. And- I decided to go on a trip as soon as I heard that North Korea was opening, and there would be a tour for Russian citizens there. And I like making films about my travels for my YouTube channel. He has a great voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so did you? Was he the only person that you contacted? Did you contact anyone else? Oh, it was. To... It was just Ilya. Um, honestly, I was kind of cautious when contacting him because he's Russian, and then you know the country that is very friendly in north korea mm-hmm. so we know all, and we know that north korean authorities don't like rfa i right. would say uh, that, that's an understatement i would think <laughs> yeah right so i thought he might refuse the interview okay out, it, oh sorry out of curiosity hmm. did he know rfa when you contacted him i don't think so i think i thought he may have googled rfa right. but yeah, in fact, until I contacted him, Ilya had only gave some comment, gave some comments to Russian media outlets. So I thought he may even respond me back. Actually, okay. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's very interesting on how you got to know him. Um, specifically, onto the broader story, I, you being the expert on it, why do you think North Korea is? Why is the for- first tour from the Russians rather than from the Chinese? Because mm. you'd think that. 
you know, once once tourism opens up in North Korea, they would want a right. lot of Chinese visitors to mm-hmm. be coming. And plus, the border is so much longer. Right. And often you hear about when people go to visit North Korea, they'll take the air courier flight from Beijing rather than from, mm-hmm. you know, Vladivostok or right. any of the other Russian cities. Um, I think it's because now North Korea has closer ties, much closer ties in China. We, sorry, much closer ties in Russia. Okay. Not only is North Korea providing arms to Russia, but also after the summit. Oh, the summit between yeah. uh, Putin and Kim, Kim Jong-un, Jong-un last in, September. In September, yeah. Mm-hmm. The exchange between the two countries has become extremely, incredibly active. Uh-huh. Yeah, not only military, but also in terms of sport and culture. Um, North Korea sent valuable players and then winter sports athletes to Russia mm-hmm. for some kind of competition and event. Okay. And also, Russian, Russia sent a group of musicians to North Korea. Oh, well, that's oh. cool. Yeah, and for the, a short visit, though. The, also, recently, there was the story about how Kim Jong-un had received some kind of Russian luxury car. For, oh. for, it's like a, a really expensive yeah. like $200,000 car or $200 million or something like that. Mm-hmm. that uh-huh. It's like bulletproof and gets really terrible it, gas mileage. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a Russian car. Uh, I think the brand is called Aurus. Yeah, Aurus, right. Yeah. And so that, that was really interesting. Although, uh, interestingly enough, today when I was in the editorial meetings... Um, the cars that are in his convoy, they're all Fords. Ford. Which oh, means that, which, which is that's a violation of sanctions right there. Yeah. So it's being smuggled in from, but anyway, yeah. back, back to Russia. Yeah, back to Russia, back to Russia um, and China. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, by showing the great relationship with Russia, I think North Korea wants to send a message to China like, hey, we are doing great. We, are, we have different options, like diplomatic options hmm. besides China. Um, So I thought the part where he talked about the food that he ate Mm -hmm. during his tour was super interesting. Yeah, Um, He mentioned that the food offered in North Korea when he went was very simple and plain. So Mm -hmm. it's just like spaghetti or chopped vegetables. And he shared his thoughts that maybe it was because of poverty that had demolished the food culture a bit in North Korea. But my thought was that maybe North Korea was catering towards the tastes of foreign tourists. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you think about this? So... I know it was very interesting. I think maybe North Korea wants to showcase the availability of Western cuisine in North Korea. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the restaurants and hotels they visited um, were considered to be the best in North Korea, right? Mm-hmm. So, but, but even in those places, the food quality was disappointing. Right. And I think North Korea's intention failed. Um But the thing is, you know, the tourists only get to see a very limited part of North Korea. Yeah, and I think part of the interview that you did with him, um, he explained that where he grew up, there was a lot of Korean restaurants, and he really liked uh, Mm, Korean food, and he was expecting to have that. And then he gets to North Korea, and it's all Western food. You know, I think that's not just a North Korean thing, though, because, like, I lived in South Korea for a while, and a lot of times they would say, like, Oh, well, we're having a foreign visitor, so we have to make yangshik or, or like a, a Western food, Western food mm. specifically because, oh, they can't handle the spicy food or <laughs> they can't handle like twenjang jjigae, which is a very pungent because they think it smells bad. So we should we should make things that foreign people like. That right. way it'll reflect yeah. better on us. Or mm-hmm. even just the idea that like Western things or style is a little bit more high end than mm-hmm. local. Mm-hmm. Right. But if you're a Western tourist and you're going somewhere else, you kinda wanna get away from that, I think, right? You wanna yeah. you wanna experience the new food. I guess food right. culture and, and domestic food culture or the local food culture of the place you're visiting. Mm-hmm. Um but again, how how can you really do that when you're on a guided tour and people are telling you you have to go here, and this is what time you're eating, and this is what we're serving. Yeah, just yeah. walking outside of the hotel was prohibited. Yeah, yeah. right. I uh-huh. saw that. In he couldn't report. leave the hotel. So Ilya mentioned that he regretted not being able to uh, visit the neighborhoods where ordinary people live and or have conversation with them at all, because you know he knows that the tourists, what tourists 
can see is more representative of the elite classes lifestyle in North Korea. Okay. Uh, I saw in the report though that he mentioned he got his hair cut in North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the hair salon in the hotel. Oh, uh, I see. Mm-hmm. So still a high end yes. hair salon. Mm-hmm. So he right. said he has some I think eight or nine options he could choose. Ah. So you can only pick those with with like a number, right? Yeah. No, uh-huh. Oh, number three. <laughs> no. Uh, so another thing in the meeting today, we were talking about more Russia stuff mm-hmm. uh, with tourism re- related. Um, apparently, a uh, Russian tour group has issued these guidelines of what you're allowed to do when you travel to North Korea. Mm-hmm. So, for example, some of the things were like, don't wear blue jeans. Don't have open-toed sandals when you're in a place where you're supposed to show reverence to the great founding fathers of our country. Yeah. Do you do you remember what some of the other uh, rules were? Um, they actually warned the tourists, basically, like, oh, you may not have hot water at all. Right, right. North Korea or the in North Korea, agency? Even in uh, the agency warned the tourists. Yeah, it's not not that you're not allowed to have it, but it, there's a possibility that the place where you're staying will not have. I see. So bring extra clothes if you want to stay warm. And also, like no heaters, so you will need to have a lot of clothes. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> so so like yeah, you're basically if you're gonna go to North Korea with this Russian tour company, you're gonna have to rough it possibly in so these certain situations. Managing expectations. Yeah. Yes, yes. But a lot of people just want to go because it's like a, a remnant of communism, and especially if you're from. Uh, Russia, mm-hmm. a lot of people, you know, they might have experienced the last part of the Soviet Union or have been born after it even. And so they want to see what things were like. The perfect place to go would be uh, North Korea. All right, let's move on. Another question I have is that um, we often write stories about how the North Korean government is in dire need for foreign cash. Mm-hmm. And so they're sending lots of workers abroad to, you know, basically take their wages and collect the money from the, the workers right. that they send overseas. Mm-hmm. But how much really can they make from foreign tourism, specifically from just Russia? I mean, it seems like if you're inviting, I don't know, 100 people in every month, that's not really going to be a lot of money. Right? right. So depending on the itinerary, Russian tourists are paying between 750 to 800 No, sorry, 800 mm. but U.S. dollars. In U.S. dollars, yes. So. And then there are about 100 tourists for each group. Okay, so that's about... Eight hundred thousand dollars each time. Yeah, that's, for that's, one group. That, but, but that sounds like a lot, but <laughs> that's really small considering that that's how you're making right. tourism and for the whole month. Also, isn't clear how much of this money goes directly to North Korea. You know, after excluding the commission for the Russian oh, travel right. agency. Right. So it's not. I'm not sure, but considering the exchange rate, it's a substantial amount for North Koreans. Mm-hmm. And then as they gradually resume tourism business with China and other countries in the future, it can be a steady, steady source of foreign currency for North I Korea. See. So how, how soon do you think they will reopen tourism with China, though? Um, maybe in April. Mm-hmm. Well, so pretty soon. I hear some things about uh, some things from um, European countries, like some you know, pro-North Korean organizations. Uh, located yeah. in Europe, they get some invitation from North Korea. Okay. For April trip. For an April trip. For okay. a group tour. Yeah. yeah so, so small which, group tour. which countries in Europe are we talking about? Like Switzerland, or is it? Um. Or like mostly Eastern European countries. So open to Europe. All of Europe. Yeah, and also North Korea is inviting some uh, journalists in Europe. Okay. And then academias. See that that would be kind of fun. I wish I wish that they would invite somebody from Radio Free Asia to do that, <laughs> you know. No. They the organization I contacted them, they yeah. say not Americans, n- no Americans, no, no South, South Koreans, Koreans, yeah, of course. And no Japanese actually. No Japanese. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Oh, I wonder why. Yeah. No, I, I don't wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. So another thing, when you with your discussion with Ilya, uh, you talked about this plastic building block toy mm-hmm. that he bought for his son as a souvenir, that we can't say is Legos, mm-hmm. but which he kept referring to as Legos. But then you went to go talk to the Lego company afterwards to discuss that. Yeah. And so what did Lego have to say? So, <laughs> I I was wondering, you know, if the Lego group is aware of North Korea producing that kind of toys. Yeah, so it was like a Lego of like a rocket ship, I guess. Yeah, like mm-hmm. a missile, And then all, right? all, all of the things that they made toys of this company, which was a Sangmyung or something like they They made like tanks and, and, and like... Missiles. Missiles and... All military-themed. All military-themed stuff. Mm-hmm. 
And then the Lego group made it very clear that they had absolutely no association with North Korea, of course. And then uh, no association with the product in question. So the funny thing is, when I got the answer from Lego mm. group, coincidentally, Ilya arrived at his home in St. Petersburg. Okay. So I asked him about the Lego Lego kind of toy, and then he said his son had made it the night before. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, how did he like it? How was the toy? And then it was very funny. As soon as the son, eight years old son, opened the box, he was very disappointed oh, because the what? quality was so poor and the instruction mm. was very, very bad. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got some photos of the completed toy. <laughs> oh, you did. Does it look like the picture on the box? Yeah, picture on the box. Yes, but um, compared to what we have here, the Lego actual Lego. Yeah. Oh, it's very. How should I say? Not poor, but different way. Um, shoddy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, th that's interesting. I, I I would like to see those pictures, and I'm sure our listeners would like to see it too. So we'll be sure to put that on our webpage. Please forward those to me later. Yeah, of course. Um, so I wonder though. Uh, has there ever been by the actual Lego company? Do they do actually war themed things at all? I mean, they'd have like a medieval series with which has swords and like like horses and stuff like that. I found a very similar one that rocket one. Oh, the rocket yes. one, yeah. But as far as I know, they don't have actual military themed ones. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, let go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I saw an article that North Korea had released like a Lego of a famous movie they had, oh. but it was clearly ripped off of another movie that lego had actually produced <laughs> as a lego like down to the people so well, they just changed maybe like the faces but we should wind this down what's the key takeaway of Ilya's, Ilya's trip to north korea that we can take away from um even though north korea tries to present a positive image mm -hmm. from our perspective it seems like a reminder of how controlled the state is yeah and then that is operates um solely for the Kim's family. Uh, the Kim dynasty being Kim Jong-un and his family. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the third generation ruler mm -hmm. uh, after Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming on yeah, RFA thank you, Insider, Jamin. Thank uh, you. We will be hoping, hope we can have you on again sometime when you produce Please. another yes. awesome story. Always ready. All right. Uh, so let's wrap up. For Emily, I'm Eugene Huang, and this has been RFA Insider. Thank you very much. See you next time. <laughs> I'm like, nervous. You're so talented.